Hello and welcome to the Cisco Support Communities Expert Series webcast on Firepower Threat Defense for Integrated Services Routers. A few housekeeping notes before we begin. As you enter the WebEx console, you either joined us via audio broadcast or by phone, which was automatically muted. And because of our large audience and attendance today, you will remain muted throughout today's event. When you have a question, please feel free to enter it into the WebEx Q&A panel located in the bottom right corner of the console. Please leave the chat window available to communicate with the WebEx facilitator for any problems or issues you may experience today. We would appreciate your feedback on today's event by taking the short survey that appears when you close your browser at the end of the event. My name is Francine Richards and I'm the Marketing Project Manager for the Cisco Support Community and moderator of today's event. The Cisco Support Community is an online forum with over half a million members where you can get answers to your technical questions prior to opening cases with TAC. You can answer many questions or contribute and rate documents, videos, and blogs. The community can help you boost your career by becoming a top contributor and getting the technical community to know about your expertise. And we invite you to use the community on a daily basis. Uh, we have a few Ask the Experts discussions currently running on the community. Uh, Cisco Unified Computing System Upgrade Best Practices and FOIP on Cube and Gateways using T3.8 protocol-based pass-through. So you can take that opportunity to learn and ask questions regarding those technologies. If you haven't already, then be sure to join the Cisco Support Community where you can share current real-world technical support knowledge with your peers and experts. Check out the Class of 2015 event top contributors and spotlight awardees on the Cisco Support Community. And if you're interested in conducting an event for us and becoming a top event contributor yourself, please go to the Experts Bureau and sign up. Take a moment to rate the content of your peers' documents, videos, and blogs, and in doing so, you'll help us recognize the wonderful content that they contribute on a regular basis. And ratings do encourage more contributions. And now on to today's presentation. Our expert joining us today is Corelli Sanker. Corelli started with Cisco in August 2006 as a TAC engineer in the firewall team in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina. As a TAC engineer, she supported Cisco security products, and since May 6, 2013, she has taken up a new role as technical marketing engineer, enterprise infrastructure and solutions group responsible for security features on Cisco's iOS and XC products. She has presented at Cisco Live 2013 and 2014, and she has also done quite a few live webcasts and Ask the Expert events for our Cisco support community forums. Prior to joining Cisco, Sanford worked for John Morrill Company in Cincinnati, where she was the network administrator in charge of the company's enterprise network covering 27 locations in the United States. She also was an adjunct professor at the University of Cincinnati teaching undergraduate level networking courses. Sanker holds an engineering degree in electrical and electronics engineering from Regional Engineering College in India, CCSP and CCIE Security 35505 certifications. We have some additional experts uh, on the panel today helping to manage the Q&A, and that is Hai Bo Ma and Aston Ayung. Hai Bo Ma is a product manager in the Enterprise Infrastructure and Solutions Group responsible for the threat defense portfolio. He is driving the branch security product strategy for NGIPS, NGFW, and cloud web security. Prior to joining Cisco, Hybo worked as a product manager in an educational startup and a leading cloud-based e-commerce software company. Hybo holds a bachelor's degree in MIS with a computer science minor from the University of Minnesota and has an MBA from the Kellogg School of Management. Aston started off his career with Cisco in 2000 and has had the chance to gain experience and contribute in different phases of testing, including feature, solution, and system test. He got started on the 7XX platform system test team. He returned to feature test roles in ASR 1K starting with the very first release and eventually moving to security, source fire, feature testing the last two to three years. Aston also has a CCIE in routing and switching. Our experts will be continuing the discussion in the Ask the Expert event now through July 3rd, so if you have more questions, please visit the Experts Corner Events page on the Cisco Support Community or reference the link that we'll post in the chat window. If you would like a copy of the presentation slides, click the PDF files link in the chat box. The recording of this presentation will be available on the Cisco Support Community as soon as we are able to process it, so bookmark the URL in the chat window and check back later this week for the video. 
after the presentation, come back and visit the event topics under the expert corner. On each event the support community presents, you will find links to FAQs, videos, presentation downloads, and at the expert events. For today's expert series webcast, our expert will start with the presentation and then we'll dive into the live question submissions for the remainder of today's event. During our live presentation, you may submit questions for the expert to answer using the Q&A box on the right-hand side of your console. So please begin posting your questions now, and this will give us the best chance of answering them. When the webcast ends and you close your event, please take the survey and let us know how you rate this event. And now I will hand the mic over to Corelli for today's presentation. Thank you, Francine. Good morning, good afternoon. Good evening to everyone around the world who has, who has uh, dialed in to listen to this presentation. My name is Kureli Shankar. I'm a technical marketing engineer. Prior to taking this role, as Francine mentioned, I used to be a tech engineer. Maybe one or two of you have had a tech case with me that I worked for you. Today, my question managers are Haibo and Aston. Thank you uh, to both of them for, for their time today in answering the questions that you may have that you will post on the Q&A panel. Today's agenda, I will be covering the company information of uh, SourceFire that Cisco acquired around uh, October timeframe 2013. And since then, we have integrated this product in the ASA platforms, as well as the integrated services router platforms. Today, my talk and presentation is going to be on the integrated services router. This product, we just announced it during the Cisco Live San Diego. Why we need the firepower and the, the differentiation between IDS and IPS for some of you who are new to this uh, security aspect of things. And um, the overview of Cisco firepower threat defense for ISR. How this helps an entire branch as one box solution offering all the services that a branch needs and some resources to point you to towards the end so you can uh, look at the uh, data sheet, uh, get the frequently asked questions answered, and we also have an at-a-glance uh, document there. Here's a polling question. We'll let you take some time to answer that. Why are the, what are the reasons for your company to invest in threat defense? solution? Is that fear of data breach or to provide a safe internet browsing experience for our users or to protect our assets from getting infected with malicious Trojan spyware and other attacks or for strictly PCI and other compliance sake only? Take a few moments to answer that. Let me move on. Company introduction. SourceFire as a company was acquired by Cisco in October 2013. Five months after acquisition, we came up with the advanced malware protection technology, uh, and we integrated that on the ESA, WSA, as well as the CWS. This is the cloud web security. Four new firepower appliances were introduced. Open App ID program was launched. Eight months later, the new AMP features, including NGIPS, integrated IOCs, and cloud-based sandboxing was also introduced. Now, SourceFire has about 52 patents awarded or pending. As you know, Cisco celebrated our 10,000th patent in the year that we acquired SourceFire. Since then, we have rebranded this product, and now we call this and market this as Firepower. What is firepower? If you look at this attack continuum, firepower operates on all of these three areas, before the attack, during the attack, as well as after the attack. With Cisco NGIPS, all the different layers of security you see at the bottom of the slide work so well together. So we're able to pull intelligence from all of these layers. Unlike traditional solutions, we layer security intelligence for greater visibility and to protect against threats 
coming from multiple vectors across this attack continuum. And with the unique approach, all the solution parts know about each other. This is, this is very, very unique. As you see here, network visibility, the granular application control, and modern threat control, all of that we can configure before. And during the uh, attack or during the content scanning, we, have, we can apply the NGIPS, the URL filtering, both category-based as well as web reputation. Web reputation is where we come up with the scoring for each of the IP addresses that are available on the internet. And the category basis is categorizing a URL to fall into certain, certain category like violence, bigotry, social networking, astronomy, and uh, others. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let's move on to the next slide. Now here, what do we mean by next generation IPS? Why is that so critical to giving you the visibility you need to protect your branches? When Gartner talks about next generation IPS solution, they address a critical factor. When there is an attack, are you able to say who is responsible for that, what, and where did the attack come from, what time or when the attack came, and how to understand the potential threat? First generation IP, so IPS solution and legacy next generation firewall do not provide all of the context aware, the who, what, when, where, and how. But our next generation IPS provides all of that that you need to know. We see far more than any other threat protection solution on the market, including deep visibility into users, applications, and advanced threats. So what does that mean in terms of visibility into branch security? Here's the visibility. We see all of the operating systems running in the branch, the browsers, the different browsers, the different smart devices like iPhones, the different iPhone iOSs that are running. Even in Cisco Live uh, at San Diego, we had a huge dashboard with, I don't know how many monitors, maybe 15 monitors there that was just analyzing the packets that the Cisco Live Wi-Fi network was processing. It parsed it through the various smart devices that was at Cisco Live event at that day. And they were able to tell what percentage were Apple devices, what percentage were Samsung devices, and to, to that level. It's beautiful. The minute we send traffic to the sensor, you can get this information about the operating system, the gadgets, the versions, the browsers that they're running, and all the details. We also extend our threat protection to virtual environments, which is extremely important. Most of our customers are moving critical processing into virtualized environments now, so you don't want to give up your visibility when you do that. <clears throat> Additionally, mobile devices like we just talked about are becoming a major way that attackers get into networks. So you don't want to um, not have the visibility into those devices and the versions that your environment is using. As you can see on this slide, the NGIPS is what we offer and we see checks all across the screen for threats, users, web applications, protocols, file transfers, and the whole nine yards. Now here's the context that we just talked about, right? The um, iPhones or whatever mobile phones that they're using, the uh, iPads, what devices that they're using, and what kind of computers, the operating systems. And we categorize what these devices are seeing and browsing the web and sort them out as priority one, two, and three, and we can base policies to block those. And next is the dynamic security control. With full awareness, we're able to determine the risk posed by communications, leveraging user identity, site reputation, and geolocation. This is very important. The minute you see an IP address pop up in the uh, Firesight Management Console, it will categorize as to, with the country flag, as to where the IP address belongs in, in the whole wild world with the geographical location of it. And you can base policies using those as well. Multi-vendor correlation. Sophisticated attackers exploit multiple vendors often 
with blended threats that combine various invasive methods such as phishing, emails, and um, stealthy network profiling. So having the ability to correlate and tabulate suspect behaviors across these various attack planes, integrating network and file level activity allows for easier and earlier identification of infected hosts. Now, retrospective security. By continually analyzing and tracking file activity without regard to file disposition, whether it's good or bad, we develop a trajectory of how a malware exploit unfolds, which enables organizations to more quickly scope the infection infection impact and shrink the time between detection and cure. We'll talk more about that when we talk about the advanced malware protection piece that uh, Firepower offers. Here's a polling question number two. What do you consider important with any product? Is it ease of configuration, ease of management, excellent alerting and the reporting capability, or all of the above? Take a few moments to answer that, please. Why do we need firepower to protect the branch location or our network? Here are companies' challenges today. We see our customers are using more and more cloud services and applications in an effort to enable greater agility and reduce complexity in their environment. A lot of our customers also allow their customers to bring in their own devices. They bring in iPads and other tablets and iPhones, other smart gadgets, everything with them when they visit. If it's the Firestorm service station or other Starbucks, people bring in any device that they have that they can connect to the Internet. Now, they're also using video much more than in the past. Companies have their employees take training online. So all of this video traffic has to be downloaded from the Internet, wherever the training is hosted by the employees sitting behind. And all of these employees at home, they have very high Internet speed. They're all so used to it, and they expect the same thing when they come to work as well. So companies are sort of, they have to provide them what they're used to. Right? It, you can't afford to have very high internet speed and the CNN pages and other heavily loaded pages load in one or two seconds and come to work and they take 10 seconds to load. So they need to provide for their employees. And direct internet access is now very, very common. Right? All of the branches have direct internet access. Before, when I was outside of Cisco, most of the companies the branch offices, all of the traffic got hauled over to the headquarters, and the headquarters did whatever content filtering that they had to do at their premises in the headquarters, and then the response traffic was sent back to the branches. But that's not the case now. Every branch has got direct Internet access, and the headquarters traffic just goes through the regular MPLS network or over another VPN tunnel. Now, now that they have direct Internet access, the advantage is that the Internet traffic from the branch just goes directly from the branch to the Internet. So the MPLS network or the other DMVPN tunnel from the branch to the headquarters is not congested. That means the company-based applications that are hosted in the headquarters will not show any latency when these people at the branch access those. But still, the branch traffic's Internet goes directly to the Internet, so the branches need to provide security for that content filtering and provide the users with a safe environment where they can browse. So that is what Firepower offers today. As you can see in this slide, as Gartner shows, research shows, just in the past few years that you see on this slide, 2013 to now, there's been a very steady increase in branch attacks, branch targeted attacks, and it's just going to go up in the next 
next year or in the future years. How do we protect the branches? Here's a typical use case. Let's talk about a typical branch where the employees as well as guests need to access the internet. So the employees, if they're company employees, just like we talked about, they go to the headquarters using the MPLS network. And the guests, and they, if they want to go to the internet, they go directly, and so do the employees. The blue line here, let me point that. Uh, okay, the blue line here, this takes the branch traffic all the way to the headquarters via the VPN tunnel. If the MPLS traffic goes down, then the tunnel will be established using the internet link. So there are two paths that the branch office's employee traffic can reach the headquarters, and their direct internet traffic, the, as you can see in the green, goes directly from the branch, and it's not hauled all the way to the headquarters. And so are the guest traffic directly sent from the branch to the internet. So that's one use case. And the other use case is where you have two branches, right? Here at the branch, there's employees uh, working off of this branch, and there are employees working off of this branch. So this branch-to-branch -branch traffic, that needs protection as well. So this goes over the, each branch goes to the internet directly using the DIA, and branch-to-branch -branch communication is here as well. So in these scenarios, the use case one and the two that we're looking at, we need to make sure to provide the employees the best possible threat solution, threat uh, security solution for them, which comprises of NGFW, NGIPS, advanced malware protection, UR filtering, as well as advanced uh, application visibility control. When we say application visibility control, these are all of the applications like uh, you know, Skype and uh, other um, applications that come. Um, the URL filtering, I have to mention here, just like there's a cloud web security, we can block or allow very, very granularly. We can allow Facebook, and then within the Facebook, we can stop them from doing certain things like posting a video or uh, even um, liking a post to, to that granularity. Now, IDS versus IPS. Everyone knows the difference, but I just threw in this slide just so I could explain to them the difference between IPS and IDS for those of them uh, who are very new to this concept. IDS is detection only. We show you what's going on. We can gather everything and show you in a beautiful report. But if the time comes to take action, it has to be a manual intervention and a user or a network administrator has to step in and get that host out of the network or block uh, the user from the switchboard level and whatnot to take the action. In IPS, we can dynamically configure the policy. We configure the policy and just leave it alone. We can say, oh, this country's IP addresses, I just do not want them accessing my web server at all. And these categories, that fall in uh, these categories. I don't want my users to access these categories at all. And if the IP addresses have certain reputation, the negative one to, um, well, I would even block negative one through all the way negative seven and say, these are very bad reputation sites. I don't want anybody going there. So to that level, we can block them. And if anybody goes to that, the um, fire site will automatically block, block those people from even going there. Now here's pulling uh, question number three. Do you already have firepower or fire site deployed in your environment? I'll go over what is firepower sensor and what is fire site management in the next couple of slides, but I would like to get a gauge of if you already are aware of firepower and if you have them deployed. Yes, I am using ASA firepower for inspection. Yes, I'm using ISR firepower for inspection. No, but I'm planning to use ISR firepower for inspection. No, I'm not planning to implement any sort of IPS, AMP, or UR filtering. I'll let you take a few minutes and uh, answer that question. By the way, if you have any questions, 
during me speaking here, go ahead and put your questions on the chat window. Hybo is our product manager. If you have any question regarding pricing or um, any other question about the product, please uh, put the questions on chat. Aston is a, a great engineer. He did uh, a lot of the testing for this product. They're both based out in San Jose. I, I can't thank them enough for uh, spending their time today and being my question manager. All right, now, Cisco Firepower Threat Defense for ISR Overview. This is a beautiful slide. Let me build this slide. <clears throat> Application experience and the attack continuum before, during, and after, which is offered by the Firepower Threat Defense. And we put all of that in a UCSC, and you don't have to take any space, any real estate in the branch location. We can simply take this UCSC series blade, which is nothing but a bare bones server, install ESXi, and put that inside a slot in our ISR 4K series router, as well as a certain models in the ISR G2 series routers. So you get this phenomenal solution, Firepower Threat Defense, on your router, inside your router, within the router, without using additional real estate in, in the branch office. A lot of our customers, real estate comes as a very big issue. They do not have rack space at all, especially like the clothing stores in the malls, as well as the gas stations. Some of the gas stations, they simply do not have room to store network equipment. They simply don't have to put a 2U server that would do content filtering. So we put all of this and we packed it in the blade and we put it in the firepower, in the ISR 4K and G2 routers. Here's the slide that would we'll talk about the ISR G2 and the equivalent ISR 4K models. Here, uh, when we go to the other slides, I'll show you the ISR 4K, the models that do not support UCSC, and they will support the NIM modules, and they will be introduced in August this year, just next month, one more month. Wait for one more month, and uh, even the units that do not support the UCSC will support the NIM module that will support firepower. Now, here are the models of UCSC blades. <clears throat> 120S, S meaning single wide. It uh, has two cores, as you can see. The, the second number there signifies the number of cores. And the 140, four cores, 8, gigs, 16, uh, 8 to 16 gigs uh, RAM, and the hard drive space is all specified there. Those are the model number of the UCSC that goes in the G2 as well as the ISR 4K. The 4321 and the 4431 here, these are the units that do not support the UCSC blade, and they will support it when the NIM modules come available in August. And here's another feature, uh, sorry, another slide that talks about the same thing that we saw in the previous slide. The ISR 4K platforms, the models of UCSC, and these are the models of ISR 4K and what they support. The 4321 and the 4431 are the ones that do not support the UCSC blade, but they will support it when the NIMs become available. And uh, on the ISR G2, here are the models uh, that will be supported for the platform. This slide is, was released in April, March, April timeframe uh, during the RSA conference in San Francisco, where the NSS Labs did the evaluation of multiple products and they released the results, where you can see Cisco Firepower is the leader in efficacy again. This goes still the highest tested, and this is fourth year in a row at 99.5%. Uh, we came in at a total cost of ownership at $17, much less compared to um, our competitors. Branch in the box with the firepower. Now, this is how firepower works. I just put in a few bullet points. We will clearly see how the packet flow happens, how we replicate packets in the next couple of slides. The data plane on the XD pushes packets to the source fire sensor or the firepower sensor, and we need to configure a few CLI. I have some slides for that as well, as to what we need to configure on the router in order for these packets to go up to the UCSC blade where the firepower sensor is installed. Now, the typical deployment architecture is what you see in this. 
The branch offices have the router. The router has got UCSC Blade. We got ESXi installed, and SourceFire is uh, one of the VMs installed. So all the branch locations will have firepower sensors installed, and uh, they will get their rules pushed down from the Firesight Management Center, and they in turn will inspect the traffic and send the events to the central collector, which is the Firesight Management, where you can get the graphical reporting. But this is where on, on the Firesight Management, this is where you can figure all your policies as well for the sensors. And the Firesight Management model and the number of sensors they support are listed in this table. If it is a virtual form of the Firesight Management, like just like the firepower sensor being the virtual, then it can support up to 25 sensors. That includes both the physical sensors as well as virtual sensors. And uh, the rest of the model numbers and how many sensors they support are listed here. The maximum that we can support today is the FS4000 series, which can support 300 firepower sensors, both virtual as well as physical. And we do have on the roadmap to, to be able to support uh, 3,000 of, of those uh, sensors. Now, Cisco Firepower Threat Defense for ISR in the IDS mode. We talked about the difference between IDS and IPS. Now we're talking about how to implement the IDS based to solution. This slide I specifically put here during my testing, we can, I installed the, the Fireside Management software and the sensor on the same UCSC blade just for testing. You know, I had one little PC behind it, and that little PC went out to the internet, and that wasn't much traffic. But unless it is for testing only, please do not install the Fireside Manager on the UCSC blade in just one router and put it in the branch and don't expect all the other branches to send. So that will be a lots and lots of events that uh, this one branch router will be receiving. So that is an, um, not a very good idea. Most of the times, like we saw in the deployment slide, Firesight Management is installed in the headquarters location. So now the host, the UCSC blade here is the host for the sensor. Um, the um, router replicates the traffic and sends it up to the sensor, the red arrow that you see, or the uh, replicated packet, and we let the original packet go through, as you can see in this little animation. So the original packet goes, and we replicate the packet that needs to be inspected up above. <clears throat> and this is the IDS implementation. So this is another view of the same thing. Um, IDS packet replication sent to the firepower sensor. This is in case of ISR G2. There is a difference between ISR G2 and 4K. So this is particularly G2. And the difference is the backplane ports that you see here, one is a PCI port, which can be only uh, configured as an access port, and the other port is the MGF port, the multi-gigabit fabric port. If you have multiple VMs here, and all of these VMs will be on different VLANs, then this is the only port you can send the replicated traffic to because you would have to configure this port as a trunk port. So the animation here will show you the packet replication, right? The original packet goes through and we replicate the packet and send it down. Now the firepower threat defense for ISR limitations, right? Here on the ISR G2, we use the right infrastructure to replicate packets. What is right? It's the router IP traffic export. So this is the infrastructure we use in order to uh, replicate and send the packets up to the fire site sensor. Multicast is not supported. IPv6 is not supported. And with that, we recommend that you apply UTD, which is Unified Threat Defense, on the inside NAT interface. Why do I say that? Because if you apply it on the inside interface, all of the computers, servers that you have on the inside interface, I'm, uh, I'm assuming all the customers will be using private address space, right, RFC 1918 address space. So these IP addresses, that will be of some significance to them, right? If the IP address starts with a certain uh, subnet, then they know, oh, these are HR computers. But once you apply UTD on the outside interface, then the IP addresses may already be translated to look like something else when they go out to the internet. So when you apply it on the outside interface, then the reporting, you can't make any sense of that because 
all of this traffic, depending on the NAT configuration, if you do patch overload, they will all look like one IP address. So that's the reason for recommending to apply this on the inside interface, so you get good reporting of all of the inside IP addresses. And here's the view on the ISR 4K. This is the difference that I talked about. On the back plane, the two interfaces that connect the router to the UCSC slot, these are the two back plane interfaces. In case of the ISR G2, I mentioned that one port is just the access port PCI, and the, one port, the other port can be configured as a trunk port. In case of ISR G2, both of these ports can be configured as a trunk port. So the animation here is exactly the same. We let the original packet go through, and we replicate the packet and send it down to the sensor. Now here on the ISR 4K, the limitations, again, the exact same limitations. Multicast is not supported. IPv6 isn't supported. And we recommend that with NAT, you apply that on the inside interface. So here are the steps that we need to complete in order to get the sensor going. We got to first configure the CIMC, which is nothing but if you're familiar with the lights out mode, in case of an HP servers or other servers, it's the same functionality to grab a hold of the management uh, console of the UCSC server. So configure that. You can configure that using a command line on the router, or um, you have to assign an IP address for that on the router console, and then you can open a browser and put in that IP address and launch the GUI for CIMC, and then start installing ESXi on the UCSC blade. So once we do that, then we have to install vSphere client on a PC. Once we do that, then we can install all of the VMs that we want. The UCSC blade, like I said, is a bare bones server, right? So you can install any VM that you like. And bear in mind that you need to size the blade on the router for the throughput that you're going to process through that. So reach out to your Cisco account team and uh, you know work with them and uh, seek their guidance to size this for you. We support any VM on a UCSC. If you can run a VM on a, on a uh, on a standalone ESXi server, we can do that on the UCSC blade as well. Once the um, vSphere client is installed, then we spin the source fire sensor and configure the uh, vSwitches, and then, you know, Fireside may, a VM has to be somewhere. It, it could be a virtualized or it could be a physical box. It doesn't matter on the headquarters location. And the next step is to add the sensor to the Fireside management so it knows what, uh, what sensors it should push the policies to and receive events from. And we also do the same thing, right? We need to add the sensor to the fire site and add the fire site to the sensor. And uh, that's, after that step, we need to apply all of the licenses. The licenses come in uh, three packs there. IPS license comes with the uh, application visibility that we talked about. And then advanced malware protection is another module, and URL filtering is another module that we need to purchase. And then we configure the command lines to replicate traffic and send it to the UCSC. So that completes the installation. And here is the CIMC I mentioned. From the router console, you can session into the UCSC blade and then configure an IP address that you can manage with. Now, watch here. The ISR 4K, the command to session into the uh, UCSC is this, and on the ISR G2, it's a little bit different, so pay attention to that. <clears throat> and the resources that I include in the end of the presentation will provide you with the configuration guide for firepower threat defense for both IPS as well as IDS. That will include all of the, the information as well that I have on these slides. So here, installing the ESXi once you configure the CIMC. Now configuring the vSphere client. So here, you need to pay attention. The double-wide UCSC blades, they have four interfaces. And the single-wide UCSC blades have three interfaces. We need to understand how these are mapped. You can get these mappings on our UCSC guides as well, configuration guides. They have them very clearly documented. <clears throat> And the single-wide UCSC, the highest MAC address is the GIG2, and the other two interfaces will be the internal backplane UCSC interfaces. And the next one is to spin the source fire sensor. And um, pay attention to this slide as well. 
when you can figure the VNIX, we need to make sure that the VNIX zero is the map to this port and the VNIX one is mapped to this port and that we need to know all of these details very clearly so you can do the mapping when the time comes after you install the ESXi um, server on the UCSC Blade. Then installing Fireside is a piece of cake, and we need to add these two guys. Come up with a shared key, right? Like uh, we use the shared key for land-to-land -land, site to site tunnel. Just come up with a shared key that you see on the screen, this one right here, and I use Cisco 123. You use the same key in both uh, occasions, adding the sensor to the fire site as well as adding the fire site to the sensor, and now they both know they need to talk to each other. And the next thing is to apply license. When you apply license, what we need to do is you need to grab this. Once you install Fireside, you will launch Fireside GUI and under the system and licenses, when you do the add new license, it comes up with this that you see. This is nothing but a six and a six, a double six added as a prefix to the MAC address of the Fireside box, right? So that's what this is, and you need to provide this in order to get purchase the license for your fire site. Again, the fire site uh, licenses are threefold, IPS and apps combined together, and advanced malware protection, and you are also doing. Now here comes the command line. This is specific to ISR G2. This, these are the command line uh, commands that you need in order to replicate the packets and send it up to the firepower sensor. And what is this in the red arrow? This is nothing but the MAC address of the sensor interface. The sensor, firepower sensor, has got three interfaces. One is for management and two is for sensing. And in the IDS case, we only use one of the interfaces for sensing. In IPS, we would use both of those ports, sensing ports, because in that case, IPS will be inline. Now, this is the MAC address that we derived from the firepower sensor. And because we use the right router IP traffic export infrastructure to replicate the packets, we need this configuration when we say IDS redirect interface is my VLAN 10 interface, and I want to replicate IDS to um, any packet that is seen by this MAC address, which is a sensor sensing interface MAC address, and then the rest of the configuration they are very familiar with. All right, and this is ISR 4K configuration line. So how do we replicate traffic here? Under the UCSC, we configure that as a, a trunk port um, with the service instance of one, and we configure the BDI interface. And this BDI interface is using uh, the GIG001's um, um, IP address scheme. Um, and then we enable UTD, which is a unified threat defense. And here, mode IDS global. This means I'm enabling IDS on all of the interfaces. You can either do this or go under the specific interface, like interface gig 00, and you can enable IDS just for that interface. And we say red redirect interface is BDI here. And here, the IPS. How do we implement IPS? So all along we saw IDS on both ISR G2 as well as 4K routers. In this screen, we'll talk about the threat defense for ISR in IPS mode. In this mode, this is the LAN port that you see, and this is the WAN port, and this is the UCSC front panel port. We already talked about what models have how many front panel ports and how they're mapped internally to the router. For IPS mode, what we do is instead of receiving the packets from the inside of the network using the LAN port, we receive the packets using the front panel port. So all of the inside traffic arrives on the UCSC front panel port, and then the inline IPS here scans the traffic and sends it using the backplane port, and then the traffic egresses the WAN port. So the animation that you will see here will show you how exactly that is done. And the WAN side traffic, again, the, port, the packets that come from the WAN port, they come to the router, come through the back plane, and then they leave using the UCSC from panel port. <clears throat> now, what happens if the VM you know, dies for some 
uh, reason, right? So what happens to that? Because it is in line, this is going to block all traffic or all the packets that go through this line, link, you know, they will be black holed and go nowhere. So in that case, what we can do is we can connect this guy, sorry, this UCSE from panel port and the LAN port to one switch, and we can change the switch port priority. So this port is always preferred and the inside traffic comes through this port, and this port will not be preferred until this VM goes down or this link breaks for some reason, and then all of the uh, packets will come through this LAN port, but they will not be inspected and they go out to uh, wherever their destination is. And here's what we just talked about, the land to WAN traffic that needs to be inspected, how they go through the inline IPS, and the WAN to LAN traffic, how they go. And the fail open can be achieved if we can put a switch in and take the front panel port and the LAN port to the switch and uh, manipulate the switch port priority. I had a sample slide of that. Sorry about that, I don't see that slide here. The switch configuration as well as the uh, the router port configuration with the switch pr port priority changed, but I don't see it here. Uh, sorry about that. Maybe we can upload the slides with that sample as well. Now I put some slides for the fireside management, right? We talked a lot about what beautiful GUI the fireside manager is and uh, what the how it shows us the traffic that it receives and what kind of visibility that you can get into what uh, your network is processing as far as traffic is concerned and uh, what devices are there on your network at any given time. So here, these are the, these screenshots will show you what users are coming in, the visibility into that context, and what web applications are they using? Are they using iTunes or some uh, SoundCloud or a double-click website? You know, that's just uh, advertisement prone as far as I'm concerned. And um, that sort of applications. And here, um, other applications like the Sonar PC and DNS, what applications is being used in your network for the most part? A breakdown of that, it is just simply beautiful. You just have to get this installed and start sending packets to the sensor, and sensor sends all of the events to Firesight when you enable logging on Firesight Manager. And the minute you do that, you will see this beautiful dashboard with a lot of information that you will be really, really surprised to see this breakdown. Now, file transfers, what kind of applications and how people are using, what are they using. And, and with this visibility, you can decide, hey, I'm, I'm not going to let people use Torrent. I'm not going to use this particular application to, uh, for my users at all. And based on what you see, then you can configure your policies. And here are the malwares that we detected and uh, what command and control intelligence, right? What kind of bots are, are, are they going to and who received what kind of spam and uh, all kinds of details. This is, this is just beautiful. And here, this one, th this is the screen that I just love the most. And this breakdown at the Cisco Live uh, monitors, it, it just was so fascinating to look at. It was real-time data as well. You could see the count increasing and it clearly showed how many of us had what operating systems on the laptops and walking around at the, the Cisco Live event. And what kind of mobile devices, right? And they even gave a nice percentage of the Apple devices uh, versus uh, Samsung at the, the Cisco Live uh, <clears throat> session. Again, this screen, this dashboard, you can go drill down, drill, 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 and get tons and tons of information of just one event that you see. This is really beautiful. You just have to uh, get it, at least evaluate it, uh, reach out to your account team, ask them to show you a demo, and they'll be more than happy to invite you over and show you a demo, and uh, then you can purchase all right, here we are um, talking about this, and I wanted to show you a few more screenshots of uh, the three licenses that you get, right? IPS and AVC comes together, and advanced malware protection you purchase, and URL filtering you purchase as well. Here, this is the um, 
awareness uh, screenshot, this, I would like to share this one as well. Here, you can get into the depth of information, how much you can drill in on just one event, right? I've never seen any other product that would do this. Who is the host? Okay, what operating system version um, did Fireside identify that as running? So this, in this case, it's running Windows 2000. Okay, what server applications are installed there and uh, what port is it using to, to communicate um, <clears throat> when, the, when the event triggered and what client application is it using, what version of internet browser, what client version, um, and the browser is going where. So all of this information can be got. And URL filtering, we talked about category-based as well as web reputation-based. So here's the policy you have to configure that. So as you can see on the left, there are various categories. You can uh, pick these categories and we can deny them or allow them. <clears throat> and here AMP, right, Advanced Malware Protection. So this one comes in the after continuum, right? When Fireside sees a file, somebody is receiving a file off the internet or downloading a file off the internet and that Fireside has never seen before. So it's like, oh, I don't know if it's good or bad, so let's just put it in uh, malware protection mode, sandboxing mode, and we'll observe what it's doing, right? Maybe, <clears throat> as you can see here, one IP address received this file off the internet, and then a few hours later, it's transmitting that same file to another IP address, and a few hours later, that new IP address is sending it to an all-new uh, destination. So not only that, it also sent it to another destination a few hours later. So in the few hours, Fireside will be able to apply its intelligence and decide whether it is a good or bad file. And from then on, that trans <clears throat> any further transmission of that file will be completely blocked. So here um, we talked about Firesight and how to manage and configure policies and all of the licensing modules that you can purchase. So here's polling question number four. Go ahead and take some time to answer that. How important is it to enable HTTPS inspection <clears throat> or HTTPS decryption? So when we go online, right, to Facebook or Google, even if you just put simply google.com on your browser, or specifically http colon slash slash google.com, it automatically redirects you to HTTPS. And that's the same case with Facebook as well. So when you do not decrypt HTTPS, when, what we cannot do is we cannot see within the packet, right, because it's encrypted. So even if you block social media, Facebook will be still allowed because the URL automatically changes to HTTPS. So do you think it is important to enable decryption for HTTPS protocol? No, it's not. HTTPS is secure. Yes, HTTPS connections are secure, but not safe. HTTPS traffic does not discriminate against malicious or compromised servers. So go ahead and take your time. So just because it says HTTPS and shows a nice yellow lock, that does not mean it is secure <clears throat> and it is a good site that uh, you're supposed to visit. It absolutely is not. So we need to know where it is going. But Firesight Firepower Sensor, just on box, it does not support HTTPS decryption. We have to have uh, Firepower's SSL decryptor on the network in order to be, uh, decrypt that and see. But just the URL filtering and the destination IP address when the browser gets the name resolution for HTTPS sites, they have those IP addresses already in the database that we use for URL filtering, category-based as well as web reputation-based. So based on that destination, we can block um, the destination IP addresses, even if the connection goes via HTTPS. All right, now coming to the very final uh, resource slide. We have four minutes to end this presentation. This resource slide, uh, go ahead and click on this. 
uh, the router security, you can Google, go to Google and say router security, firepower, threat defense for ISR. You can take the very first hit, uh, Hybo and I are adding more links to the page. You can also do router security, CWS on ISR, and um, Hybo and I own that product as well. We have uh, a lot of links on that page. We will include this WebEx link on the router security page as well. Today it has uh, two links at a glance document as well as um, a data sheet that you can uh, review about the services that Firepower Threat Defense offers and uh, the configuration guide for that. I will also include the step-by-step -step guides to do uh, to configure Firepower Threat Defense for ISR in IDS mode on ISR G2, as well as 4K, as well as um, IPS. So all of that will be included in this. The, this guide already includes that, but what I'm talking, up, uh, talking about is the step-by-step -step guide that uh, you would need for each and every step and not uh, a huge consolidated guide like, uh, like this. But that's there as well, we will post that. Uh, so that completes the presentation, and I thank each and every one of you for taking the time to attend this uh, session. Uh, hopefully, uh, this was a very informative session for you, and uh, a call to action I would suggest is to reach out to your account team today and ask them for a demo at their location and also have them uh, size the UCSE blade if you have an ISR in your branch office location. We need to provide all our employees with a highly secure and excellent user experience when they browse the internet. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Corelli. And we're, uh, those of you who are uh, still uh, in attendance, we're going to be answering some of the uh, Q&A right now. I want to uh, thank everyone for participating in the event polling, and we're going to answer some of your questions right now. If you can't stay with us for the Q&A, uh, then please be sure to click on the evaluation link provided in the chat to let us know how the session met your business needs and expectations. Uh, so our first question here, Corelli, is there any difference in inspection capabilities between Firepower on UCSE in ISR versus Firepower module in ASA 5225X? Is there any significant advantage or disadvantage of using one versus the other if you have both in the environment? Uh, not at all. Uh, everything that, uh, that the physical appliance is capable of doing, the virtual appliance is capable of doing the same thing. And it is the same whether you have the firepower appliance on the ASA or the ISR. So if you have, depending on what equipment you have, you can make use of this. Thank you. And another question here, what happens with multicast traffic when deployed inline? Will it pass uninspected or blocked due to lack of multicast support? The multicast packets, we don't support that because firepower as a feature is not uh, even in the FIA, feature invocation array. So we don't even replicate multicast packet when we send it up to the sensor for inspection in the case of IDS. But in case of inline IPS mode, all the packets go from one side of the sensor to the other side. In those cases, if there are multicast signatures, and they will be subjected to multicast inspection in that case. Thank you. Very good question. Uh, and can you please explain licenses, what is included, and what needs to be purchased? Um, the, there are four uh, licenses that we need to purchase, right? Let me go over that. Um, one second. And we have time to elaborate on that, um, Corelli, okay. so take your time with that. Yeah. So the virtual software, that needs to be purchased, right? That's one thing. The other thing is the advanced malware protection, and another one is the URL filtering module and IPS and AVC. So, Hybo, correct me if I'm wrong, there are four PIDs that they need to purchase or three PIDs that they need to purchase.
Okay, he probably will answer on the chat. All so right. SPS signatures and ABC are bundled together that we need to purchase. URL filtering is another module that needs to be purchased. AVC is an uh, uh, AMP, sorry, AMP, Advanced Malware Protection is another one. Next question. Okay, uh, let's see. <clears throat> Uh, there is another question here on what about SCADA environments? I'm aware of the 5506HX offering. Any ISR SCADA specific models with integrated firepower services? Not sure of that model. Are they talking about the drive specification? It wasn't clear if, if the person who uh, posted that might go to the Ask the Experts session following this event. Uh, that's a forum where we can answer questions for, say, about 10 days after the, the uh, broadcast. If you can post that question to that Ask the Expert event, then uh, Corelli and the team can follow up with you. Yeah, I need a little bit more information about that. Supervisory control and data acquisition, and that's what comes up when I Google SCADA, but Sorry about that. If you could ask me the same question with more information on the Ask, Ask the Expert, Expert event that uh, I will be doing for 14 days starting tomorrow, that, that would be great. So we can hash out and uh, give you the right answer. Perfect. So if, if uh, they would post that, I would appreciate it. Um, let's see. Okay, with multiple uh, sensors, can FireSight report on specific sensor traffic, i.e. toggle between looking at traffic at one location versus the entire enterprise? No, no, you can uh, get to see one sensor's traffic. Okay. And in order for FireSight to essentially manage firepower sensors on remote sites, what are the bandwidth requirements on the link between data center and branches? This question gets um, asked uh, quite often. The way to answer that is firepower virtual sensor is uh, capable of uh, receiving a million events from the various sensors. In case of this virtual fire site, it can receive, it can support up to 25 sensors, right? So it depends on how many events each of these sensors are going to send. And they talk to the fire site management over the same link on TCP port AB305 to receive the rules and send events and whatnot. So it depends on how much traffic that the router at the branch is going to be processing for normal user traffic. And on top of that, how much of the traffic is the sensor going to inspect and how many events the sensor is going to generate and send. So I can't, without knowing your traffic pattern, say one way or the other. So your account team will be the best resource here so they can come look at your traffic pattern and size the UCSC model for the ISR that you have and also offer recommendations about uh, what the link should be between the branch and the headquarters location. Thank you, Corelli. Another question here, what skill will Firefight, uh, I'm sorry, Firesight management reach for the router deployment? Uh, I have many customers with 500 to 5,000 routers. Okay. Um, here's one correction from what I said uh, for the previous question. Firesight manager can receive up to 10 million events. Sorry about that. I thought I mentioned 1 million. I need to correct that. It can receive up to 10 million events per second from the various sensors that it manage, uh, it can um, support. And for this question, yes, a lot of our customers, we have uh, 7-Eleven with 10,000 uh, locations, 12,000 locations uh, over all over the U.S. and uh, so are other customers. Scale has been a major ask and we do know that and that's the reason we have uh, the roadmap, uh, roadmap item that we discussed that will be uh, supporting uh, 3,000 sensors. But we are working on the manager of managers 
Again, I do not have any ETA on that, but we do understand the need for it, and we are working towards that. And here's a follow-up question well, on Firesight uh, as well. Uh, Firesight. I'm sorry? One quick question. Francine, hi. I was going to also jump in to uh, answer some of the quick questions. Yep. So uh, I, I was muted. So uh, let me jump, just jump in and quickly go back to the question about different product offerings, uh, different packages you have for the Firepower offering. The first package, were, there are four packages we have, as uh, Kreli mentioned. The first package is the industry-leading next-generation IPS with the application visibility control. The second package that includes the content featuring in addition to the next-generation IPS and application visibility and control. The third package, we have the next-generation IPS with the application visibility control. Uh, and we also have our advanced malware protection that is part of it. This is, again, it's an industry-leading product we have included. The very last package that has all three pieces in addition to advanced, uh, uh, in addition to the application visibility and control. So that is the next generation IPS, the application visibility and control, the content filtering, and again, the industry leading advanced network protection. So those are the four different packages you can pick from, depends on your uh, security needs. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Okay, and a follow-up question on FireSight. Uh, FireSight, should it be implemented in other, uh, in other server, correct, not in the UCS? Yes, I would highly, highly recommend, please do not install the FireSight Manager VM on the same UCSC that is also running the sensor, because unless it is just for testing or you only have one headquarters in one branch, which is okay, or you just have one location, period. In that case, that's fine. But if you're going to use the Fireside Management to be able to support 25 other sensors, then remember, all of these sensors are going to talk to this one Fireside Management, right, management server that you have. So keep that in mind when you do that. And I would only recommend that if, if it is for testing purpose. Otherwise, you could use another ESXi infrastructure if you have it on the headquarters and spin a VM on that. And another question on Firesight again. What port does the sensor use to talk to Firesight? I believe it uses TCP port 8305. It, is, um, it uses um, a secure connection to be able to send policies from the Firesight management because we use the Firesight management. Except for configuring the IP address and the gateway and the DNS and the NDP server, there, we don't get on the Fire, Firesight sensor at all. The sensor, nobody accesses the sensor besides that. And to add the sensor to the fire site and um, add fire site to the sensor. Everything is done on the fire site management server. So that is a critical piece. And that's what sends the, pushes the policies that you configure down to the sensor. And the sensor sends the event. So it uses uh, port 8305 for all of uh, the sensor to fire site communication. Thank you. And here's one on CWS. Uh, does Cloud Web Security and Firepower use the same uh, database for URL filtering? I know they do not presently, but they will in the future. CWS uses our iron port uh, sender-based database for URL filtering, and uh, Firepower, uh, since it is a newer acquisition than ScanSafe, which is uh, rebranded as CWS, uh, Firepower hasn't started using the same iron port database just yet. So give it another few months and uh, they both will be using the same uh, iron port center based database. Okay, and this is a question about um, installing third party uh, products. Uh, how about non Cisco services? Can we install three party, uh, third party VMs on the UCSE in addition to Firepower? Yes, absolutely. In case of a clothing store at the mall, they do not have real estate. So they use uh, the ISR G2s, the only box in that clothing store, and that is their Active Directory server with the DNS, DHCP, everything installed on it. And it's the same server that has uh, Firepower installed as well. So all in one box. You can run any VM on the UCSC. 
bear in mind how much traffic it is going to process and how many times you're going to send the packet down to UCSC and bring it back up, uh, back to the router, and for it to be inspected back again. All of these uh, in the UCSC and out of UCSC back to the router, that is going to be counted against the throughput license of your box. So keep that in mind as well. And jumping back to uh, Firesight, uh, does the Firesight Management Center slash Defense Center server use or host a database? Which one? Uh, it does not host a database. It uh, reaches out to an external database for its uh, uh, URL and uh, um, it, it downloads what is latest. It reaches out to an external one. Okay. And what is the performance drop on the routers with all features enabled? See, that combination becomes endless. That is uh, a question that we uh, see a lot. Uh, we cannot determine the number of various VMs that customers may have a need to install on the UCSC, but what we are planning to do is to get the performance numbers for some of the Cisco-based services that are in the virtual form. For example, we have ASA in the virtual form. We have the WSC, wireless LAN controller, in the virtual form. We have the WAS, the acceleration box, the web acceleration box in the virtual form. So all of those we are planning to test together on the UCSD and uh, provide performance numbers. And hopefully in the near future, you will see that on our solution guide and uh, also on our data sheet with some numbers so you can understand how many virtual machines that of Cisco services that you can install on the UCSD and for what sort of throughput for a branch. Okay. And here's another question that goes back to the licensing. Is there a multi-year subscription license that they can purchase? Yes, they can purchase either one-year license or a three, uh, one-year subscription or a three-year subscription, which is a certain percentage of uh, uh, every year. So yes, there are two subscriptions that you can purchase. Again, uh, the account team would be a good resource. And we also have an ordering guide that will be on the router security page as well, uh, as well uh, that I shared on the resources slide. Great. And what does the front panel port on the UCSE mean? The front panel port, we have, depending on the model of the UCSE, we have uh, two to three front panel ports. Uh, one port is marked as M for management only, and you can use that to remote control the UCSC blade like a light board in case of some servers, and you can get into the CIMC GUI console of the UCSC when it is just plain and empty with no operating system on it to install ESXi or other server operating systems. But the other front panel ports, they could be used to receive data from the LAN side, or they could be connected, you know, wherever the customer has the need to connect them and use them. Okay. And this is a, a kind of an involved question, but uh, we have the time to um, uh, elaborate on it. What about service chaining? So can we install ASAV, VWLC, and VWAS on the UCS eBlade? Yes, you can. Service chaining, we, we just talked about that as well, different VMs that we can install on UCSC. But again, uh, careful planning uh, should be done prior to installing multiple VMs on the UCSC, especially when we talk about WAS in the virtual form, um, that whatever packet that it sees, it needs to send that after back to the router. So these packets will be counted against the throughput license of the router in case of this 4K. We have throughput licenses for them. In case of the 4451, it's one gig throughput, and if you purchase the additional license, it could do the, the two gig uh, throughput for you. So in, if you have multiple VMs, and if they're going to inspect, all, if one VM is going to do its job and send it to another VM, and that traffic doesn't have to come back up to the router, that's one thing. If it has to come back up to the router and then down back to the UCSC, then you need to expect latency as well as um, uh, the, to, to hitting the throughput limitation of the router. 
Okay, and one other question here. I think we have time for uh, maybe one or two more questions. Can CWS and Firepower Threat Defense coexist on an IWAN router? And if yes, does this apply to both passive IDS and active IPS deployments? So feel free to elaborate on that a little bit. Sure, IWAN is intelligent WAN. Yes, CWS and Firepower can be uh, installed, configured on the same router, but one particular flow, if I, as a user sitting behind the router, I'm going to Google, and the config on the ISR should not allow my Google flow to go both to CWS and the Firepower, meaning the same flow cannot be subjected to two different inspections, considering they both different work completely differently. CWS does this proxy-based redirection where we change the destination IP, we change the destination port from ADN 443 to port 8080. So you can send two different sessions to two different, you know, packets um, to Firepower and CWS, but just don't send the same flow to both of those. That's not supported. Okay. And I think that's going to conclude our uh, Q&A session <clears throat> for today. Uh, if you haven't already logged into the Cisco support community and recently, we encourage you to do so, and we have a brand new look and feel and increased options and features. So log in and start sharing today. And just to note, our presence in social media continues to expand, so we encourage you to visit the community and join us through the various channels. Uh, we also uh, continue to expand our reach in many different languages, so perhaps we have one already available in a language of your choice. And these are not simply translated sites. They are active, standalone sites in the native languages. Important to note there. Uh, you can look for more information on IT and technical uh, training, log into the Cisco Learning Network, and take advantage of the technical webinars that they have to offer. So go to the link provided in the chat to learn more. Uh, before signing off, uh, please take a few moments to complete your evaluation of today's session. This will help us address your business needs and interests in the future. I'd like to uh, thank our experts for sharing their expertise with us today, uh, Corelli, uh, and I would like to thank uh, Hi and Ashton. And I would also like to thank Lisa Latour, who helps make all these webcasts uh, go on behind the scenes, and she's done that for the last year with uh, wonderful results. So I want to thank all of those people, and I want to thank you for attending, and have a great day. Thanks, everyone.